Good evening and welcome to Omni Dogs Vault. Saturdays in the Bat Cave, uh, where it's turning into more of a DC show with my Minister of Comics, Taylor Brown here. How's it going, Taylor? I'm doing great. I put a lot of effort in this week to finish our readathon. <laughs> I was telling you, I think uh, my eyes were a little bit bigger than my stomach with this one. I was like, yeah, let's just read all the action and rebirth, I mean, all the action and Superman rebirth stuff. It won't be that bad. And it's like a, over a hundred issues, which I didn't realize until after I finished the final volume. <laughs> yeah, so it's quite the undertaking. I feel like after tonight, I'm gonna kind of need to put put Superman away for a month or so and kind of get a break from the Man of Steel. But I'm really excited to talk about these books, though. Yeah, we're talking about Superman in action, the Rebirth, um, the Rebirth uh, books, Superman. And action comics. Where's an action here? Let's see. Superman in action. They had two different storylines. Um, they at one point converged and were to. Whoop, where'd it go? Here it is. Superman reborn. They converged and told this story. Um, so to start with, you really can't start without these two books. Road right. to Rebirth, which we got in hardcover from Hamilton Books for like six bucks. That I was put great. A, I just put a Hamilton order in last night. Yeah. It's we a should great website. We should, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> and then uh, Superman, Lois, and Clark. This, these are the two books you have to read before reading uh, any Rebirth Superman because this tells you what happens to the new 52 Superman, um, what happens to the Lo Lois and Lana of uh, that Earth when they become superwomen. Um, and that was actually, I almost had time to read those three tra uh, trade paperbacks because those are good books. I like superwomen or super, is it superwoman or superwomen? I think it's superwoman. Superwoman, yeah. Those are three good books, and I liked them a lot. Um, That's Lana Lang is Superwoman, right? Right. And Lana, I, um, yeah, and Lois is one. Lois of that earth is one, too, until she gets sick, sick and dies. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you have to read this because it, t it tells about the end of the New 52 Superman and what happens to bring this particular Superman, who I guess is – the pre new 52 Superman back into continuity. Um, he's married to Lois Lane. As you can see on the cover, they have a child named Jonathan. Um, so you need to read those two things. I think this is the best thing Dan Jurgens has ever written. I didn't know he was an artist too. Did you know that until you read these books? I, I feel like he started out as an artist. Oh really? Cause I remember I towards think. the end of this action run, you would see some of him doing some of the pencils for some of the end, the closing issues. Which yeah. I had no idea he was an artist too. I didn't, I'm not, I haven't really read anything else by him besides this, maybe a couple other issues, but I never really read him before. So oh, I've, read a lot of, I've read a lot of them and I have to be honest and say he's, he's not my favorite writer. I don't hate him, but he's just not my favorite writer, but this is easily the best thing he's written. This was really fun, really interesting, really, um, it all made sense and it put everything into place and everything. Um, and Lloyd Wong has a question, which is a good question. I believe that the Superman is getting an omnibus. The yeah, Tomas Superman by Tomasi and Gleason, I Gleason believe. Gleason is getting an omni, right? So that's going to be like a 45 or so issue omnibus. Probably a little bigger than that because there's 45 issues and in their Superman run. And there's also some annuals and other issues they add in there as well. So that'll okay. probably be a close to that's gonna be a big omnibus. That's gonna be close to 50 issues, I would think, or even over 50 issues. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, I'm having a good weekend so far. And, and Lloyd Wong asked a question: Does volume four, the hardcover wrap up on the Tomasi run nicely before Bendis comes on? Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit, but to kind of spoil that, I think it does wrap up in a really neat and tidy way to really open the doors for Bendis to come in and do what he's gonna do. Which yeah, I, know I some, haven't read any of. Yeah, I, I, I know Jess and I are hoping to review that in the future. I think we'll probably wait until his run comes to a, a conclusion because I do believe he has, he has announced that he'll be finishing up in the foreseeable future. 
Okay. So I think we'll be able to read that and we'll give ourselves more lead in time than <laughs> we did for this review. So uh, yeah, so I think both series actually, both action and Superman really wrapped up very neatly. I think and so, from yeah. what I understand, I mean, I don't know what happened behind the scenes. From what I understand, they were going to change the creative teams for these books anyway. I think a lot of people kind of insert the narrative of Bendis wanted to come into come into Superman titles. And he wanted to steal it from the other writers and artists, and that wasn't his intention. From what I've heard, it was they were going to make a change anyway, and that's when they brought on Bendis, and he they, he that's what he wanted to do. If there was an opening, so I don't think he stole the books away from these creators. No, I don't. I think you're right. I don't. I don't. I don't think he needed to. They told everything they needed to tell in the issues they did. Um, not everybody gets a 90 issue run on a book, especially like Superman. Um, I don't know. It, I think it's fine. Whatever they, um, whatever they worked out. I will say what I love about these deluxe editions is they still have the really cool underneath part. Whatever the, what is this called? The book, Jack, the book, the book cover, I guess the book? card, the card, what's it called? Cardboard stock. Yeah. Cardboard something like that. Stock? Someone who's smarter than us in the comments, let us know. Yeah, what is <laughs> going on here? Um, I, like, I do like that a lot better than just like plain black or something like that. Oh, yeah, totally. Which DC does do a lot. They Especially with Omnis. Um, and um, standard size hardcovers, they do that a lot too. Like with Superman, the final day of Superman, they just have like a black uh, cover underneath. Hate. Which is not a big deal, but it's kind of boring. It's like you might as well, you might as well just put something underneath there. Something cool, yeah. like a nice wraparound cover. And I, that's one of the biggest things I'm really annoyed with with DC right now. I mean, I don't want to get into their DC rant, but I just don't <laughs> like the way that they just totally got rid of the deluxe line. I mean, I, I, I'm not in their board meetings. I'm not looking at their sales numbers. Maybe they weren't good. But from what I can see in the Omnibus Collectors Group, a lot of people bought those. At least yeah. It seemed like it. So they seemed like it was a really good way to get these books out there. And I love the way they look on my shelf, the white spines. Minus the green arrow blue and the black of the new Batman by Tom <laughs> King, which even my wife walked by my shelf and was like, why is that black? I'm like, don't I even start. Like, don't even ask me. No one knows. No one knows why. It just doesn't make any sense. I think DC uh -huh. just, put, just put a bunch of colors in a hat and picked out black. Okay, let's just do that. I don't even but, know if it was that much of a decision went into it. And the thing is that the good thing about these books is that they are completed. There's a lot of DC rebirth, a lot of DC rebirth deluxes that aren't are, that were just canceled. Like the Flash by Joshua Williamson, you can't get those anymore in, in deluxe hardcover, which right. is so frustrating. I think if you start something, you should finish it. That's just my personal thing. So they need to get them collected in standard size hardcovers or trade paperbacks. I mean, again, it's a first world problem, but it's still annoying as a collector. Yeah, it reminds me of how they released Metal originally, the the four Metal books. And then the Young Justice metal book. I'm really so, glad I wait for the Omni though. I, don't, I mean, I don't know when that's going to happen. That's been like what, like three years since I came out, two and a half years ago. When did I do? When, I I feel like it was summer of 2017 when I talked to uh, Scott Snyder about it. 2018 or 2017 when he said, "Oh yeah, there's an omnibus coming out and it's going to have this, this, and this," and I and I went, "Okay, cool. I'll just wait." And after about a year, I said, I'm not waiting anymore. So I just got all the five different formats that it's it was released in. Um, you're right. It's a first world problem. I get it. Um, but we're collectors and we are annoyed by it. Right. It's not like we're on a show about third world problems and we're trying to solve that and fighting about these first world issues. Like we're in a we're in a first world culture and we're talking about things that we care about. Right. So yeah, Eric Ramirez is talking about the Flash got axed. Like I already said, Wonder Woman and Green Arrow. I don't. Did Trinity get? Did Trinity get a deluxe? I thought they've got a standard size hardcover. Um, Trinity, Trinity, Trinity. That was the one by Francis Manipul, I believe. I think it just got a standard size I hardcover. Feel like those were just standards. But yeah, Green Arrow only got one one volume by Benjamin Percy, and I might I might just get rid of that, to be honest. It, it didn't really floor me, and it's kind of annoying the way it stands out on my shelf. Yeah. Eric Ramirez also says Detective Comics, but the good thing is that they actually let James Tinian's run get completed out in the deluxe editions. There's four yep. deluxes for James Tinian's run that you can read his complete story. And that's, that's coming out as an omnibus, right? That is also coming out as an omnibus. Right. So it looks like they're starting to churn out these Batman and DC Rebirth Omnis right now. I'm sure yeah. at one point they'll do a Tom King series of Omnis. That's probably going to be 
probably three omnis, I would think, or maybe mm-hmm. two each. I'm not sure. That's a, he did like 85 issues. That's a lot of comics trying to pack into That's two omnis. That's a long omnis. run of Batman to do. And, and he's also doing that Batwoman, cat, Batman Catwoman series with Clay Man right now. It's taken forever to complete because apparently Clay Man's doing the work of his career here, and he's taking a long time to really get it right. So I'm fine with waiting, but maybe that'll be in an omnibus in the future as well. That's, that's going to be a 12-issue maxi series. Oh, has any of it come out yet? No, they haven't even solicited it yet. Oh, wow. It was, it was supposed to start coming out this past January, I think. I, oh, think he's, I think he's just been really working on it a lot. I think he's saying that they want it to be like an evergreen like DC story to stand toe-to-toe with some of those really big DC stories that we mm. all have on our shelves and really care about. Well, I mean, 80% of my books are unread, so I have time. <laughs> well, I think the reason I'm behind that is one of my major complaints about this run is that the art is so back and forth because they're doing uh, double shipping. They're doing two issues a month, which means that you can't have a consistent artist on one right. arc. And so even in, even in issues, which is one of my biggest pet peeves, when the art changes in an issue, it when is. there's a couple pages drawn by a fill-in artist, it just really takes you out of the story. Right. Especially when you have artists from the caliber of Gleason, Doug Monkey, Jorge Jimenez. Like those guys are on another level, and you have some random fill-in come in. And they really can't fill in that gap the way that they should. Yeah. And it kind of takes you out of the story because the characters look different. It's just not the same consistent tone. So, I mean, that's that's probably a complaint I have for a lot of Rebirth books is that the art is so inconsistent. But that's because of the double shipping schedule. So you can't really blame the creators for that. Well, that makes a lot of sense that you explain that. Um, well, oops, excuse me a second. Just drop something. Well, before we really jump into these books, Jess, I never read the New 52 Superman stuff. Can you kind well, you of didn't. give us an overview of what you thought about all those books and what your overall opinion was? Because I've heard a lot of negative things. Um. I think I'm a little bit, I, well, with new 52, I felt like it, I wanted it to be a fresh start for all the characters. And I felt like that first issue of justice league was exactly what I wanted with justice league with, with Batman up on a roof and green lantern saying, Batman, you're real. And Batman saying, and you're too bright, tone it down. And (laughs) That's what I wanted, them meeting for the first time. And I really dug the idea of Superman being held in a vault, depowered, and I wanted him, I wanted to see him like really grow and learn how to just be a person before being a Superman after having been kept in a vault, you know, with no exposure to the sun right. to keep him depowered. And to me, it just New Fifty Two just sprung out, and he's battling monsters almost from issue six on or something. I mean, he. I'm just like this is no different. I and I have to say, when it comes to comic books, it's not always best to listen to me because I've been reading them for so long, and I'm at the point now where I'm kind of tired of superhero battling monsters. Where you love punch outs. What's that? You love endless punch outs, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so tired of um, endless punch outs and stuff. And then there could be a new reader watching this saying, oh, that's my favorite part. And I totally get it. it that, that, is, um, that is a fun part of comic books. And I, I think my problem is I've just been reading the endless punch outs for too long. But New 52 Superman just didn't. I don't know. Even with Morrison at at the helm of, I think it was action, um, they just weren't memorable to me, and they just seemed like old Superman stories where he's just all of a sudden he's fighting monsters, and I'm like, shouldn't he be discovering himself and learning how to use his powers and how an alien becomes... Uh, adapted into a different culture, blah, 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 stuff like that. And there was nothing really very interesting about New 52. This was the most interesting New 52 Superman. <laughs> his, his death was yeah, the most yeah. interesting part. And his attitude was a lot different than the regular Superman that we know and love. He's very brooding. He's kind of dark. He's a little bit more jerky in his, in his nature. Whereas we're used to like you know, the bright, happy, smiling, hopeful Superman. And so they really kind of try to make him more like Batman almost in a way. 
coming yeah. out. That's at least that's what I've heard. So you don't think the Morrison Action Comics Omni is worth gonna, is worth the buy? I'm probably gonna get it anyway because I like Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I know. I and this is where you this is where you don't want to do what I do. <laughs> the do as I say, not as I do. Um, it, it's still at. Morrison's action is still interesting, but it's just it's just not the the um, Superman as uh, as as such a fresh, clean slate as I really wanted. Okay. And how was the Jeff Johns? Didn't he do a little short run with uh, John Romita Jr. in New Fifty Two as well? Yeah, and I don't think I like you know I I don't particularly think I cared for John. I, I have no problem with JRJR's art in general, but for Superman, I don't think I cared for it. And I think that put me off it. Um, and I'm having trouble remembering it. So it can't be that memorable. I think Superman's one of my favorite characters. And the fact that I feel like new 52 didn't have that mem many memorable, the most memorable super, uh, book was when Kara became a Red Lantern, in my opinion, in New 52. Um, okay. Yeah, you love that Red Lantern run. And then in her own book, in her own book and Red Lantern, she became a Red Lantern. I thought, that's a cool idea. Okay. And Daniel Lennon has a good point. We we're kind of talking about how long runs can be and how it doesn't have to be really a long run for it to be good. He says Green Arrow by Jeff Lemire is pretty good, though. It's a short run, but maybe that's why it's so good. It leaves you wanting more. And so that's why I think a run doesn't matter how long a run is. I just think it does it really capture your imagination. Does it really take you somewhere different? That's what I want right now. As someone who's been reading comics for a very long time, I've, I mean, we all know the beats of certain issues. You know exactly how it's going to end. You know what's going to happen in the next one. You know how things are going to wrap up. Give me something new. Give me something fresh. And a lot of superhero comics are too afraid to do that because they don't want to mess with the toys too much. So when a right. run really surprises me, like Jeff Lemire's Green Arrow run did, it really does something different, that really grabs my attention. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of books like that with DC and Marvel at times. Um, I, I will say that these, um, I felt like overall, we can start talking about the individual books, but overall, these two books give it a really good start. It gets off to a really fast, interesting, fun start. These two books in particular um, are are really good. I really like them both. I will always keep them and always reread them because I really like them both. And so New 50, I'm sorry, Rebirth got off to a really good start in Superman with these two books. And that's Lois and Clark and Death of Old Guy. Oh, Final Days of Superman. <laughs> And of course, one of the reasons is, is is it had art by our favorite Michael Yanin, or however you say his art. Mikel Yanin, yeah. M what is it? Mikel Yanin. Mikel Yanin. Yeah, I mean, he didn't do all the art. I wish that he had because yeah. his art was by far the best. Again, it's one of those things where it's like they were. I mean, they were just trying to get this out pretty quickly, so they had to have some fill-in artists. I just I, you can't compete against this in my opinion. He is just fantastic, and that's Doug Monkey. He was able to do some really good pages as well. But they there were a lot of switch up in art. That was true for pretty much all of these books. Yeah, even finally the Superman. Right, here. right. So I mean, you really can't compete with Mikhail Yanni. He was just fantastic, and I love his work on Batman as well. And as someone who didn't really read the New Fifty Two Superman. I didn't really feel that much for Superman during the story. I mean, I think the way they ended the story was solid. I think they really did him a good service. But it, I mean, I, I think it was good for me to come in and read this because it really, you really do need to read this to understand the rebirth run. You really have to. Yeah. I think Superman is the most inaccessible run out of all the rebirth titles because it requires these two books that you have to read beforehand. Mm -hmm. This run definitely isn't like a new reader friendly book, in my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you disagree with me. I don't. It really requires a lot of pre-existing knowledge to really understand what's going on. Yeah, and it's I even though I wasn't that knocked out by the Superman New Fifty Two, you know I'm a super huge Superman fan, so I had to read it all. Right. Um, and I um, I uh, 
so I did feel emotions when they did have this Superman die. Um, because I am probably one of the few people of New 52 readers that liked the fact that he and Wonder Woman had a romance. I thought that, now that I thought was cool because that was new and different. It made sense to me that two super powered beings would fall in love because only they could understand each other. And um, I, I'm one of the, probably the few people that actually bought that Superman Wonder Woman <laughs> series and read it and enjoyed it. So um, I, I definitely did have feelings for this New 52 Superman. And it's not like I wanted him, you know, to disappear. I thought the way they handled it was good. Um, and I thought the way they brought back, I, I guess the more popular Superman uh, was fine. And I thought the way they worked it into everything was really good. Um, so I, I probably will would get just to reread um, any kind of new 52 Superman, just because I love Superman. So if they release an omnibus of any new 52 Superman, I probably will get it anyway. Yeah, I've heard mixed things. Some people really like the Morrison run, some people don't. I haven't heard a lot of great things about the main Superman title, but I have heard some people do like the Morrison action run. Right. And Hayden um, McGee has a question for me. Is the Minister of Comics the Earth 2 reboot of Taylor? No, that's just the... <laughs> <laughs> That's just the name that Jess bestowed upon me because I work in ministry and I needed a catchy title. I was going by Taylor for a while, which is fine, but I'm just going to show you. You get them a more catchy title. Everybody else has one. You have the Omnibus Collector, Omni Dog, We Can Geek Them, the rest of them. So and I Mr. Body Massage. He's Take beating up Spider Man. That nickname. <laughs> um, I, and here's a, somebody that did not like Marcella did not like uh Superman Unchained. I'm one of the few people that did like Superman Unchained. I actually will go so far as to say I loved Superman Unchained. But I get it. Some people didn't. So that's the way it goes. Um, I hope I agree with Jess because I just got that in my Hamilton order yesterday. Well you got it for like six dollars, right? Yeah so I can't get I won't get that upset if I don't like it that much. Yeah and I told you that that it was a mixed opinion on it. Right, but six dollars again. So I was like, I'll just risk it. I'm yeah, to, I'm gonna really have a better Superman collection, and I, and I've gotten a lot of great Superman books off Hamilton. I was telling everybody on the Omnibus Collectors page last night that Secret Identity by Kurt Busiek, the hardcover, mm. is on there for six ninety five, which I got a month ago, and then immediately went out of stock after I bought it, and then they have it back again. So if you don't have that book, you desperately need it because, in my opinion, that's the best Superman story ever told, and probably will ever be told. It's fantastic. Um, and I think that it is in my top three. Wait, what do I like better than that? I you like, like Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. Isn't that your favorite? That's my absolute favorite. Yeah, there's one more. Um, what's the... Uh, oh, Jess, get a grip here. Not Secret, or Secret Origin is great. Oh, Birthright. You like Birthright. Birthright. Birthright's the one I love so much. Yeah. I just, I just tell Jess what he likes. Yeah, you've got a much better memory of what I like anyway. <laughs> um, Sam Cluxon has a has an interesting opinion. Superman is so hard to do as an in-continuity ongoing title. Many great writers have tried and failed. The character only seems to excel in Elseworld stories and other one-shots. I mean, it's a definitely interesting opinion. I think for the most part, you're right. And Jess and I always talk about how Marvel in general has the better runs, whereas DC has the better like standalone evergreen stories. And Superman definitely has a lot of those. He definitely yeah. has some of the best, in my opinion. But I think there are some good super, Superman runs. But for the most part, I think that you are correct in some ways. Yeah, because I think we feel that, I feel, and I think you feel too, like Secret Identity, Birthright, Secret Origins. All-Star Superman. All-Star Superman, Red Sun, American Alien, um, Superman for All Seasons. Right. Um, those are just the Superman books, but those are all standalone stories that are awesome. And you, I think you're right about that, uh, Sam, that that he works, he seems to work best um, in some of these one-shot formats, except for the book that nobody seems to like, and that's Superman of Tomorrow. Everyone loves the, it's, it's kind of similar to 
uh, All Star Batman and Robin. Everyone loves the Jim Lee art. They just yeah. hate the story. <laughs> well, the story. I mean, the story's okay in Superman for Tomorrow. It's just not as great as Brian Azzarello can be. Whereas the All Star Batman and Robin just made no sense whatsoever and was unfinished and stupid. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Marcelo has a good point. Half of the Else, uh, Elseworld Superman stories are retellings of his origin. A lot of yeah. his great standalone stories are pretty much his origin story, just retold in a different way. It, it, yeah, and you'd think it would be boring to read about the retellings of his origin. If I if I had a, re a section in my Superman library that was like retellings of his origin, and you looked at it, you'd think, how many times can they retell that story? But all these things we're talking about are done so well and so different and so interesting. They are retellings of his origin, but they're so different and so interesting and so fun that it doesn't really matter. Right. That's actually what I should do. I should have a secret origin. I should have an origin section of my Superman library. Now, we've talked about our favorites, but what do you think is like the best standalone book for a new reader to Superman? Because we just talked about these books we're reviewing today aren't the best introduction for new readers. No. What is like the one book you would say, read this first before you read anything else? Um, I would say Secret Origin by Jeff Johns. I do like Birthright a lot by Mark Wade, but I do prefer Secret Origin because I love that dynamic duo of Gary Frank and yeah. Jeff Johns. I just, they're just some of the best creators. And I think um, Jeff Johns and Gary Frank are, I mean, Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips are by far my favorite duo. I think Gary Frank and Jeff Johns are right under them, in my opinion. Yeah. They're my favorites. I, in terms I agree of with Secret Origin as a place for somebody to start for Superman. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, so if you're watching this, I think Jess and I both agree Secret Origin or Birthright by Mark Waid are both really good places to start. Um, again, I love Secret Identity, but I think that's better when you have some more Superman books under your belt because it helps you to appreciate the character even more. And I was just telling Jess the other day, I don't think I really loved Superman as a character until this year. And Secret Identity was the book that really sparked it in me. And I finally just had this thought in my mind, like, okay, I get it. I finally get what's so special about this character. Mm -hmm. For years, I was just like, well, he's just so boring. He's so vanilla. He can just do anything. But then you realize he is really the, the, the linchpin of the DC universe. And yeah. even though Jess didn't love the Doomsday Clock story, that's basically what the whole point of that book was. That without Superman, you can't have any other superheroes. You can't have the DC universe. He is essential. That yeah. he is the aspirational, hopeful character everybody else looks up to, and we as human beings should aspire to be. And that's why he's so important. And he is like us in that way. That he is. He feels like he's an outsider trying to help those who are in need. And so he's there. He's very much a relatable character, even though he's that much stronger and that much higher above us. Right. So I don't think I really understood him until this year in particular. And Lloyd Wong has a good point that I agree with, but I don't think a lot of people agree with it. I don't know that Superman Grounded, the storyline, got a lot of love, but I loved it and by JMS. And I felt that that was a really interesting direction. This was pre-New 50, pre 52. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting direction um, for JMS to take. And I... And I really, I, I wish more people liked it, but but they don't, and there's nothing I can do about it. So, you know. What's the basic premise of that book, if you can remember? Well, if I remember correctly, he walks across the earth to okay. experience life as a person in his Superman costume. And uh, Lloyd, tell me if I'm getting this right or wrong, because I read it. I mean, I don't think it's been collected, and I don't think I've read it since it was in floppy form um i i feel like he didn't fly he walked everywhere and this is where he established himself as a hero to everyone on earth and not just the united states which is where it was a little controversial because um you know it was like i can't even remember it was like the superman in the 40s was not described as truth justice in the american way that came with like the radio serial or the radio serial really introduced a lot of the stuff we know and love about Superman. It introduced kryptonite. Yeah. That wasn't yeah. there before. I think the radio show really changed Superman a lot. Yeah. The, the radio serial introduced a lot of new concepts for him, but they're also the ones that 
that tried to drive the point home that he's only an American hero, which at the time, you know, we're in the middle of World War II, right. made sense. And now that it's, well, back when JMS wrote this, it was, I think, the early 2000s, it was time to make him a more universal hero. And he's just as happy putting out fires in Iraq as he is in America if he's saving innocent lives. So right. um, I, I think he would just, in this story, he would just walk across the world, um, you know, rescuing cats out of trees and having lemonade and just trying to experience life on the ground instead of the 10,000 foot view, just see what it's like to be a regular person. That to me is a much more uh, organic idea for an omnibus than Superman Exile and other stories. Uh -huh. um, I, I feel like Grounded would be a great hardcover um, because I, I thought it was a really interesting direction. Yeah, well, Luke, who else likes it? Lucas likes it. Luke, Luke, uh, Lucas Aragno likes Superman was, Grounded as well. Yeah, it wasn't always about saving the world, right? Uh, Lucas. So you, there's three of you who like that book at least. Yay. <laughs> there's dozens of us. There's dozens of us. <laughs> yeah, Superman does a David Carradine where he's walking around exactly. Solid. I was going to say, yeah, that reminds me of the end of Pulp Fiction where Samuel Jackson's like, you know, I'm going to walk the earth like Kane in Kung Fu. Have and you ever, Daniel N. Have I you really had an opportunity to see that. Have you, Kung Fu? No, I just know that from Pulp Fiction. But I know, I know David Kerrigan from Kill Bill. Yeah, he was Bill. So I know that that he's Quentin Tarantino. Obviously, minds old actors from different TV shows and yeah. movies he loves. I from will say, I, I remember loving Kung Fu growing up as a kid, and I was a huge Mad Magazine fan. Easily the funniest Mad Magazine parody ever written was about Kung Fu. It was so funny. I still remember how funny it was. Um, but uh, yeah, he he was. Um, I loved him in Kill Bill. Yeah, he was great. I think actually, if I'm remembering this correctly, I heard Quentin Tarantino say he, you know, um, the the last cover of Mad Magazine was Leonardo DiCaprio in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You know where he has that Wild West show? Yeah, he has, they, that he's the cover of the last Mad Magazine, so he's like pretty proud of that. <laughs> do they do they make a real Mad Magazine for that? They yeah they actually have a Mad Magazine in his house in the yeah, house in the movie. That I remember, but I thought they just made that up for the movie. I'm not I'm not a Mad Magazine connoisseur, but I just remember Quentin Tarantino saying how that was like one of the last things out of the door for them before they before they closed down. Uh, was making that for him. Oh, uh, that that helped make that picture spot on for me that they they um, did his caricature on the cover of Mad Magazine. Apparently they're going to make a TV show of that of that Wild West show Bounty Law. They're actually oh, going to make yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be really interesting. I could watch. You know what? I'm ready to see that movie again. I love that movie. That's I like was parts three and four and two of that movie. I'd love to see more of that. It was such a good movie. I know so many people who thought it was so boring, and I was like, I was transfixed the entire time. It's not like a fast paced movie, but it's so interesting. Oh, the acting is fantastic. The, his his attention to detail is ridiculously good, and it's much better even on the second rewatch when you see all the breadcrumbs that lead to the ending, and you see yeah. all the things that they really showed and pointed forward to what was actually going to happen. That's in my top three. I think Pulp Fiction, Django Unchained, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood are my top three Tarantino movies. They're just I mean, fantastic. His attention to detail, just having 93 KHJ on the radio. I remember when KHJ was the big radio station in LA, and um, this was what, 1969, 93KHJ? I totally remember that. I would go down and visit my brother and I would listen to 93KHJ. That was an AM station. Wait, 93, no, I think it was, oh, San Francisco's was 610KFRC. Uh, so I think KHJ was F, no, it must have been AM in 69. I can't remember. Who gives a shit? Well, you're. <laughs> Nobody cares. Let's talk well, about Superman. Well, you were like eight or you're like nine or ten when that uh, the Manson murders happened, right? I was ten. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> People like this kind of stuff, so don't. <laughs> but before we jump into Superman, a uh, female-led remake of Kung Fu is scheduled for next year. 
Oh, no, that's you interesting. You can watch that. Yeah, that's interesting. AM and FM, okay, yeah. So we talked a little about the final days of Superman. Um, Lois and Clark, this one's by Dan Jurgens, And I, I think this one was the better out of the two for me personally. Which I one? Thought, I think this one was better out of the two. Okay. I, just, like, I was able to connect to this one more because I really saw the family dynamics of John, Lois, and Clark. I just really – I love this. I, I wish I could get an original art for this last page. It's not a spoiler, really, but it's just – I love this last page where it's – because it just reminds me of my family with me and my wife, my son Sam, and our, and our golden retriever Murdoch. My wife, my wife was like, I really want that page. Like, that would be so cool to have on your wall. My <laughs> wife, like, teared up when she saw that. She loved it. And I think that's why I connect so much to the, these two runs because they just – I'm able to really relate to them in a different way because I have my own son. I'm married to a woman that I really love, and we have a great relationship. And it's just great to see that portrayed in comics. You don't really see a solid family in comics or in entertainment that much. It's usually just like you know broken families yeah. that hate each other, which, I mean, that can be entertaining. But we don't really see intact families together really working together as a unit. And this really just inspired me and really just – it really spoke to me on a different level, I think, than if I had read it last year before we had Sam. I think it just really – I just love it because Lois really reminds me a lot of my wife. My wife is – she's a super hard worker. She's a great mom. She's tough. She's funny. And I just really liked how Lois was so integral to this run. She wasn't just the damsel in distress. She actually saved Superman sometimes. Yeah. I love the one where she drove the Batmobile around. And she had the Pellbat suit on. I just really love how they work both of these other characters into this book. It's not just about Superman. It's definitely these three characters working together as a family. And that's why I really liked this book a lot because it really brought that to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what, um, what did you think about Action Comics 1 and Superman number 1? Out of these two, I liked Superman by Tomasi a lot better. Yeah. I actually think this first volume of action was probably my least favorite of the run because it was just an um, and like, like an endless punch out with Doomsday. And I'm just kind of I'm 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 I just don't like Doomsday as a character. I think he's so boring and one dimensional because all he is is a physical opponent. That's all he yeah. can do. He's just a monster. And I think the Batman v Superman movie really just took the wind out of my sails for Doomsday. I just want a moratorium on Doomsday from now on <laughs> in DC history. I'm just I'm just kind of done with that character. I think he's so one note and so uninteresting. Uh, I think some of the stuff going on was interesting. I just really wanted the Doomsday stuff to be over. But that was like what, like seven issues of him. It was a Doomsday. lot of the run where it was nothing but punch outs with Doomsday. It really was. But I really love these stories. And this first, I think the first hardcover of Superman was my favorite of the of all these books. I love the the battle with the Eradicator. Yeah, that, that was really fantastic. That that's actually the background that we have right now. Them beating up the Eradicator. Pretty much, the Eradicator is um, an android from Krypton, and he wants to essentially keep the bloodline pure. He wants to remove the human parts of Jonathan Kent so that he's a pure Kryptonian. Uh, that story was really interesting. I just think this book really brings out the family dynamic much more. Whereas Dan Jurgens in that first volume seemed to be much more interested in just Superman punching Doomsday in the face and being punched in the face by Doomsday. Yeah. Whereas after the fifth time, it's like, what can you do that's different at this point? <laughs> I don't really want to see this anymore. And right. I love the issue when they're, at the, when they're at the fair as a family. That was fantastic. It really reminded me a lot of Tom King's issue yeah. of being at the fair with Superman and Lois. I just, again, I've, I've seen so many issues with Superman just beating people up. I've seen so many issues of Batman fighting criminals. And I, yeah, it's entertaining to me, but give me something different. And this issue was different. Just Superman trying to be a dad at a carnival and not trying to be Superman, but obviously something comes up and he can't help it. And Lois gets mad at him. I just thought that I was loved, great. I loved it when no, the this whole sequence when they're on the roller coaster. Right, right here. Figuring it out and she starts to get mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> I just... I, Tomasi just do, knows how to write marriages and father-son relationships. Yeah. Seen most clearly in his Batman and Robin run, which I, th I, st I really do like the Superman run, but I think his Batman and Robin run is stronger in my opinion. Yeah. But you can tell, I know, I, I believe he has a son in real life and it really shows. He knows that father-son relationship and he knows how to write a realistic marriage. 
So often in comics, marriage is just a woman nagging the husband, and that just really gets annoying. <laughs> and sure, that does happen to some people in real life, but as someone who's happily married, I want to see a good marriage portrayed in comics. And I love that Tomasi and Jurgen both do that in these books. So I think that this book is much stronger overall in this first volume. I agree. And I think this is the best the entire run ever was. Uh, let's see. Because um, the art was consistently good. It was Monkey, yeah. it was Jimenez, and it was Gleason, whereas throughout the other volumes, it was a lot of other hit-and-miss artists for me who filled in here and there. Oh, I was just looking at number three, and I have some things to say about Deathstroke. Okay. He is the most boring villain ever written. <laughs> I am so tired of him. I I picked up the Rebirth book of him. and By even, Christopher Priest? Yeah. Even yes. Priest can't make him interesting. I don't think you're a big fan of Christopher Priest. You don't like his Black Panther run either. Uh, there's no Black Panther run I like. Okay. I like the movie, but I don't like any Black, Black Panther book. If you really want to fall asleep really quickly, read the ta Coates Black Panther. That was like an Ambien. But <laughs> well, I, I, I really like his Captain America run. I thought that was really good. But his Black Panther, that first that first hardcover at least, I just couldn't – I almost fell asleep like five times. Yeah. I don't – yeah. But I I don't know. I'm skipping ahead to number three just because Deathstroke is showing up, and I'm like, oh, come on. De Deathstroke is so boring in everything and anything he ever does. And I don't think he's got an interesting side to him at all. And I really, I, I just find him dull to the extreme. Doomsday has to be less interesting than Deathstroke. At, well, least, at least Deathstroke has a personality. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Yeah, I'm, I don't, I'm not a big fan of Doomsday. I think the no. most, I think one of the, painful stories for me in this Superman run. I forget what book it was in. Do you remember the one where they're going across country on the, like, the American history tour? Oh yeah. It, it, it turns into like a history lecture. I'm like, why am I reading this? This is just, and I love Tomasi. That was a rare miss for Tomasi in my opinion. Yeah. Like, wait, I, was that number four? It was an interesting concept of them taking John on a road trip to really appreciate American history, but it just became like a boring it was like they sat you down in a classroom were telling you all these history stories. I'm like, I'm reading a Superman comic. What's going on here? Yeah, that I, was Superman number three. I think this is my least favorite volume of this run. I just remember like there's a lot of just random stories I just didn't really get into. And there was not that much. There was like a lot of hit or miss art as well. None of like, the main guys were really in here that much. Right. It was frustrating um, for me. And I get the whole double shipping schedule. I understand that. But it's just whenever you have – artists of that caliber, you have to have at least guys who can fill in that are of that caliber to some extent. And then I thought it had a kind of a random parallax story in it. Well, some it, of these, some of these, um, some of those issues weren't even written by Tomasi. No, there was, I think one by James Robinson. There was one by someone else. I, yeah. There, there were just some random fill in issues, which I just didn't really connect with at all. Yeah. Well, and here's the, here's the death stroke issue that I thought was drastically boring. <laughs> um, where Lois goes undercover to write a story about Deathstroke. Um, okay, why? Like, I'm not even interested. Um, there, I like the. Um, let's see, are we still in Superman? Um, I liked it when they went to Apocalypse. I that thought was interesting. reasonably interesting. The whole story run of the fact that I think in action. It's where we got the God Slayer, or the God Flayer, who was trying to kill Lex because he was going to become the leader of the new dark side. Dark, the new dark side, the leader of Apocalypse. That was an interesting story, I thought. And then, and I thought that that was Action Comics, wasn't it? I'm sorry. Was that Action Comics. Well, and there's the part, they're 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 here uh, in Superman on Apocalypse. Oh. So I when think it, it starts yeah. out with action comics. They fill it out later. And yeah. Superman. Yeah. Um, so I thought I, I liked the whole thing on Apocalypse. I thought that was really interesting. That Lois became a fury and Apocalypse was looking for a leader and that the gods slayer, whoever I love the John 
um, took care of the dogs of doom and turned them into nice dogs. I, the whole thing was just fun and interesting, I thought, in a different way. So that was the that was probably the storyline I found the most interesting was the God Slayer and what was that? Was that number th God Slayer uh, and the Apocalypse part? I just thought that was uh, was really good. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Um, Raphael Miranda agrees with you. He couldn't even finish the Deathstroke New 52 omnibus. It's half red. I think oh, Raphael, I'm so sorry oh, you even bought that. No one asked for that omnibus, and I, 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 I never heard anybody who actually likes it. Um, yeah, no, we have Reborn here at the bottom of the pile where it kind of belongs. <laughs> <laughs> um, Marcelo's asking about it. We're, we just haven't got to it yet. Um, it's, um, Let's talk about it then. That's that's in the second volumes of each of these books. At least for me, I didn't buy that standalone hardcover because all the issues are in here. Um, you, you, but you have, to, I, you have to go back and forth between volume two of Superman and volume two of Action Comics, which I hate. Which I, I know, I know it's annoying, but I didn't feel like buying a whole book just to not have that inconvenience in my life. I didn't, I couldn't justify that purchase, but I understand why you do it. Yeah, I did the same with Monster Night of the Monster Men with Batman. Well, this that well this Reborn is definitely better than Night of the Monster Men. I hated that book. Yeah, I didn't like that book either. It was so um, dumb. They did it, they did it six issues into the new Batman Rebirth run. It's like, why are you ruining the momentum of this book <laughs> with yeah. a stupid event that nobody wants to read about? Yeah, um, it it wasn't that this was was bad necessarily. Re Superman Reborn. It was a crossover that happened. In uh, what was it? Books two, book two, yeah, both books two of action and Superman. That's when reading yeah. happens. Um, it first of all, it just felt disjointed that it. The, I, I stopped reading it in both books and just read this, mm -hmm. which was a lot easier to do. Um, I I thought that it, as far as a Superman crossover goes, it was okay. Um, anything involving Mister Mix's plick is. At this point in time, is sort of lame to me. I don't. He shows up what every ninety days? I think he said he used to back in the old days, and, <laughs> and I thought he was funny as a kid. But but the they should have they should have stopped where they did with him uh, in whatever happened to the man of tomorrow. Do you know who voiced him in Superman the animated series? No, Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Mr. Mix up like <laughs> That's, That's the annoying boy. He's so annoying. I, but I, yeah, I I don't want to ruin who because at one point in action comics to kind of back up, a random Clark Kent shows up. Yeah. You don't know he doesn't have any powers, but he has all of Clark Kent's memories. You're like, who is this? And you find out who he is in this book. And I was just like, eh, that was kind of weird. Yeah. I, I wasn't wasn't a big fan of it. And like Marcelo said, it's pretty much just a way to kind of retcon everything that's happened before. And that's one of my biggest my biggest criticisms of this run are the inconsistent art and the how much they tie into the fact that Dr. Manhattan messed with time. It's just like, can we just get on something else? Like the whole Dr. Oz thing was so drawn out. The whole thing with an extra Clark Kent was so drawn out. Mm -hmm. I kind of wanted some new stories that didn't have anything to do with all that time displacement stuff and all that time readjustment. I just wanted something different than that. And they really spent a lot of time focusing on these storyline beats, in my opinion. This, I was like, this is too much. This is how I remember Mr. Mix's flick is this drawing right here. Yeah, that's that how he was when he first showed up, like back in the 40s. He was just an imp from the fifth dimension or whatever, and he showed up to goof around with Superman. And and I mean, this drawing style is fine. It's fun. It's goofy, and it's great for an imp. But at at this point, he really I think he just needs to be retired. <laughs> I, that seemed I mean, to be what the story was trying to do in a way too. Well, I hope he could. A little bit. I hope so. Re retire Doomsday too. Do you know what I'm saying? And Deathstroke apparently. Yeah, and Deathstroke. Yeah, let's get rid of all three of them. Do you understand what I'm saying about all these stories being really tied into the whole rebirth concept? It just kind of got to be tiresome at some point. It's like, can we talk about something else at this point? And I think Jurgens did that a lot more than Tomasi did. 
And that's why I kind of got weary during some of these storylines. Like when you finally find out who Dr. Oz is, I was like, Mr. at least you're finally, yeah, sorry, Mr. Oz, <laughs> Dr. Oz. <laughs> sorry, I was thinking about that TV show. <laughs> um, when, you, when you finally find out who Mr. Oz is, I was kind of like, hmm, I'm not sure how I feel about this. I'm still kind of torn about how I feel about it. I think it's an interesting story concept, but I think that really messes with the origin of Superman. And really, I don't know if that's going to play out long term. I, my only, the only thing I can tell you as a longtime comic reader is don't worry about it. He's going to be wiped out in the next reboot and not exist. Apparently, he plays a big role in the Superman Bendis run, from what I've heard. Yeah. He, uh, 10 years from now, he's not going to exist. Five say, years from now, I don't want to ruin it for those who haven't read it, but can you see why I, I kind of felt torn about it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I felt torn about it, too. I thought it was interesting and really cool for them to go there. They took a right. chance and went there, and I thought, wow, this is quite something that they actually went there and did this. How are they – how is this possible? And I thought it was an interesting story for who Mr. Oz was and his manipulations behind the scene. Um but I don't know that he's going to be deep enough, a deep enough character for them to keep him going. I, I, and it really does screw with the Superman mythos. And I just don't, I, as a fan, I don't, I don't want to see him again. And his story wrapped up in a really weird way where you're like, wait, so he wasn't really a bad guy in a way. So it's just like, I don't, it was just a, Really strange. It's so tied in a Doomsday Clock. That that thing is frustrating. And I, saw, I like Doomsday Clock, but it's so beholden to that book. You really have to have re, you really need to read Doomsday Clock to really feel like you have a, you actually have a, a climax to this story. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Otherwise, there's just a random person changing things. You know what I mean? You really yeah. have to read the Rebirth one shot by Jeff Johns and Doomsday Clock to really capstone this run. I'm glad I'm pleasing <laughs> Sam here. <laughs> That's like I was telling Jess. That's like I was telling Jess. I had a really bad day on Thursday, and at the end of the day, I was like, I just want to like just destroy the Earth. And I just, I actually downloaded a game on my phone called uh, Solar Smash, where you just can just like, shoot lasers at the Earth and throw asteroids at it. And I was like, was this game created by Jess Bragg or sponsored by him? <laughs> that seems exactly like the game you would run, you would create, Jess. <laughs> as sick of everybody as, as I get. I always say Jess is the nicest people hater I've ever met. <laughs> Thank you. And Lloyd Wong has a good point. Sending how do you say how do you say his name? Mr. Mix of Mix Mixes Click. There's a there's like a proper way to say it. I can't remember what it is. I always just say mix, mixes pick. Mixes tricking pick. him into saying his name backwards. I mean, how dumb can the imp be getting tricked into saying his name backwards? Is that the literally the only way he's ever gotten it happens every single time. He yeah. Has to say his name backwards. So, yeah, mixes I can pit lick. I can see why you want to retire that character then. Yeah. Here's a good point. Only Grant Morrison should be allowed to use kooky DC characters. Now, Grant Morrison writing Mitz's click click, that could be interesting the way it was with Alan Moore. So, um, and Sam is, this is the way Sam says it, Mixia's Pitalik. I know there is an actual like DC verified way to say it, but I can't remember what it is. I don't like really care that. I much. don't care either. I'm not gonna... <laughs> I don't want him to exist anymore, so I'm not going to bother to learn how to say his name right. We always say that uh, Je Jeff's not rubbing off on each other. I'm making him more critical, and he's making me more jaded and cynical. <laughs> <laughs> um. So okay. So we talked about books two because in that are the um. Reborn stuff, the, yeah. The reborn things, yeah, and that take that takes up a solid chunk, and then um, then there's uh, um, the Superman Revenge Squad that that uh, comes to life. One thing that I thought was missing here, and I'm not sure where it happens, is in one of the first books he rescues Hank Henshaw. Cyborg Superman, yeah. Yeah, and Henshaw's normal. Um, he's being manipulated by uh, somebody. I don't, I actually, that's not the point. But he's some, at some, somehow he turns right into Cyborg Superman. Where, where is the part where he goes from? Does it gradually happen? Does it happen like boom right away? Where's, 
I he never read the original Cyborg Superman, Superman stuff. Superman. Cyborg Superman, he came out of the death of Superman, right? Well, I know that, but I mean, in yeah, this but, story, he's he's like a normal guy when he comes yeah. back from Jupiter or wherever, and then boom, he's Cyborg Superman. So when did that happen in this story? I don't remember it. I think he used to be he yeah he used to be normal that he wanted to become Cyborg Superman again, and so he made him Cyborg Superman again. In this yeah. book, yeah, he tra I think if I remember correctly, he kind of transformed himself back into Cyborg Superman. Oh, I totally he, he missed, missed that. Superman's like, "Hey, we fixed you. What's going on?" He's like, "Well, I wanted to go back to the way that I was because it's kind of weird because he's like a blonde haired blue eyed guy. And almost like he turns into like a black haired Superman with you know, it's it is kind of random. I thought that character that character doesn't really appeal to me that much either. Hey, Kencha. Yeah, I just thought he was kind of eh. I don't know. Well, the whole Superman Revenge Squad is full of characters I could care less about. I, I think the Eradicator is interesting. Yeah, I think he, I think he's one of the more interesting villains tied into really wanting to preserve the purity of Krypton. Matalo was whatever. He didn't really play that much into this run. I like the, yeah. I like some of the General Zod stuff. They yeah, had. I thought even how you see Zod take hold of this planet and actually recreate Krypton with his wife and his son was interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the rest, I like how he, they all just mistreated Mongol though. That was really funny. Yeah. How he punches Mongol into space and he hits a satellite. Oh, that was funny. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Here's when um, Ursa shows up, Zod's wife. Um, yeah. I, I thought that the Zod part was interesting enough that I wanted to read it. And I love that. Um, I think this is the last we saw of Blank, right? Yeah, he didn't show up again after that because he yeah. showed up. He was a big deal in Lois and Clark. He was the main villain of that book, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, and he's what? 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 Like, who created him? Where is he from? I've never seen him before as a character. Have Me you? Either. Okay, because I had no idea who he is. Because they acted in that in that Lois and Clark story like he was a big deal. Like he was a big villain they fought before. I've never even heard of him before. And Marcelo has an answer for you. He says the whole cyborg Superman thing got twisted because of the merging of Superman histories and Reborn. So that's probably oh. why. Okay. Reborn, it, Reborn was weird because it changed everything, but they didn't really acknowledge it that much. It was like, oh, yeah, it happened. Whatever. Everything's different now. And it was yeah. like, oh, all right, fine. All right, I guess I'll go with it. It's comics. So I'll just pull a Jess Bragg and say, I, I guess that happened. I totally had to do that. Yeah, I did all that. I think Jess really changed my comic reading life. I just pull a Jess Bragg and I'll understand something. I guess that just happened. That was like yeah. a girl of it. That's the only way you can read X Men. <laughs> I mean, you can from X Men One and go. That's the only way you can ever pick up an X Men comic is just go. Um, okay, this must have happened earlier. That's why I'm not like a count like a continuity guy who has to have everything fit. It never makes sense, no matter oh, what. Yeah. Even all the crises and all that stuff, you can never make things make sense. It's always going to be weird. You make no. your own continuity in your mind. You pick what's important to you. Who really cares? Yeah, I just know I don't. Story. That's all I care about. Just right. a story. Right. So I think the Zod stuff was some of the more interesting stuff from the Jurgens run, the action right. comic stuff. So one thing I want to ask you about: What was your viewpoint of Lex Luthor in action comics and his whole character arc. Well then hmm you know never to trust him. So I still didn't trust him as far as the comic went and I'm talking about him like he's a real person. As far <laughs> as the comic went I felt like he he did everything he could to help Superman and he and Superman helped each other, uh, especially um, uh, when the um, the God Slayer came to kill Lex because he was going to uh, become the new leader of Apocalypse. I felt like he and Superman worked well together, and he begrudgingly became an ally of Superman. So I thought his character in this run was... Um, for the first time, for me, I think he was um, relatable and reasonably interesting. Yeah, I, I really did like his character arc to some degree, but sometimes, like him and Superman, would be so up and down. Sometimes, like it was, they, like they, they would have the same arguments over and over again. So didn't you? Didn't you already have this argument five issues ago? Yeah. It, it was, sometimes it got a little bit repetitive. 
Like one yeah. point he like melts his Superman logo and then a couple issues later he has it back on again. You're like, hey, I, I wondered and about then, that. And then he brings it up later. I already melted that logo. It's like, what are you talking about? You're just wearing it like two issues ago. That's yeah. And yeah, that was a bit hit or miss sometimes. And I I know what did you think about the multiplicity with all the different Superman? I really like this, but I don't know. I was a diversity by Grant Morrison, but I don't know that you did. So I really got into this. I didn't, it wasn't bad. I didn't get into it. I think I even texted you and said, should I yeah. get more diversity? I've heard a lot of good things about it. So uh, I mean, if I read that, I probably would have enjoyed that more. You would have, you definitely would have. And I probably should get it because it did play into um, Dark Knight Metal. Remember, they kind of had the map of the multiverse that they have in multiversity. Yeah. Because uh, I, I think that the whole dark universe is underneath that map in a way. Like you flip right. it, that's the dark universe. Is. So I do want to read that. It wasn't a bad story by any means. I just didn't really know who any of the characters were. Well, so I yeah. really get to it. And I did because I read Multiversity, and I really enjoyed this arc. Who wrote this whole thing? Uh, it was Tomasi, wasn't it? And Swamp Thing was there. This was a good thing, a Swamp Thing. This that was a book too. too. That's a book two of Superman by Tomasi, right? Yeah. Swamp Thing was um, in the beginning. So that's by Tomasi and Gleason. Uh, I liked how they had some Swamp Thing in there. That was really good. There was a good portrayal of Swamp Thing. And then the uh, all the, who was warning him uh, about the coming of all the various... Um, I mean, and here is Swamp Thing in like multiple pieces coming out of the earth. That was an interesting story. And that's Jorge Jimenez art. And that was fantastic. Yeah. Also in book two, I love, I think I talked about this already when Lois Lane's wearing the Hellback glove and she drives the Batmobile. That was one of my favorite moments of this entire run. I just thought that was so cool. I just think Lois Lane's a fantastic character. And I just love her and Superman together. And I love that they made her a really active participant, actually fighting the bad guys alongside Superman. Yeah, was, Lois kicked ass in this book a lot. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. And she was like, like she would save Superman a lot, which I yeah. really like. How many times can we see Superman save Lois? It's like, it's still going to happen throughout, throughout his history, but it's like, let's do something a little bit different. And I liked how Jonathan, they threw him in and do it a lot. You know, sometimes he's like, Jonathan, you have to stay at home. But I did like when they invited him in and actually brought him on missions with them. Yeah. I like to bring them together. That's, I think there's a lot of good stories here. There's a lot of stories that are meh, and there are some bad stories. But overall, the characters of Jonathan, um, Lois, and Clark were always strong. Yeah. And that's what really kept me going. That was the through line that really kept me through this book, even though I didn't enjoy all the storylines. The right. characters were really interesting. And actually, now that I'm looking at it, I think Multiversity might have been my favorite story arc. Multi Multiplicity might have been my favorite story wow. arc. And I, can, I can see being completely lost if you didn't know who all these characters were. I didn't feel lost. I just didn't really care about the characters because I didn't know who they were. Right. I, I wasn't confused at all. It was kind of like, I just don't really know who these are. I'm sure if I read it, I would like it a little bit more. And even with Lana Lang being Superwoman, I never read that book, so I didn't really feel connected to her when she showed up either. Yeah. But I know you read it, so you probably felt even more connected to her when I she did. showed up. Yeah. Superwoman is a good book. I liked them. I and like even the, um, the the Superman from China, what's his name? Something Cloud. I, I can't, Ken I can't something? remember. Someone in the chat could probably let us know. Uh, but I didn't feel an attachment to him at all. Kong. Yeah, so I didn't feel an attachment to him at all because I never read that book, even though I've heard it's really good. And I've read it, so I felt I felt an affinity towards him. And that's by Gene Yang, who did Superman Smashes the Clan, right? Correct. I still need to buy that. I haven't read that yet. That's a great book. Sam Cluxon has the random question of the day for Jess Bragg. Well, that is a random question. <laughs> yes, you once tell a story about a girl pouring a drink on you in a bar, or did you dream that? Did I dream that? Uh, no, I did. I think on Omni Bros, I told the story of a girl threw a drink in my face. I was about 24, um, and I was. this is how small of a town Carmel is. Um, this is when I was living in Carmel, California, and I had a girlfriend at the time. And this, I ran into another girl at a bar. Um, I didn't have plans with my girlfriend for the night, and I was just sort of out, and I just happened to go into a bar. And this girl 
who was extremely attractive and we were attracted to each other, she and I are having a drink at the bar and I have a feeling <laughs> things were going to go somewhere. And my girlfriend at the time showed up out of the blue. Maybe somebody called her or something, but she showed up out of the blue, grabbed my drink and threw it in my face and it hit me right in the eyes. And I couldn't see anything. I'm like, what the hell? And she could have beat me up at that point for all I know. I couldn't have, I couldn't have defended myself at all. But it went right in my eyes. My light, I think I was having a bourbon and ginger, and it went right in there. And I'm like, whoa, what the hell just happened? And I'm like on the floor and I'm wiping my eyes. And by the time I get up, both girls are gone, and I'm standing there looking like an idiot with like drink all over my shirt and face and not sure what to do. Was that one of the most embarrassing moments of your life? It's top five. And then Mrs. Omnidog came around and whipped you into shape. Yeah, I haven't messed around on her at all. <laughs> That's how I knew I should marry her because I never messed around on her. That's funny. I do remember you telling that story, but I totally forgot about that until Sam brought it up. That was probably like three or four years ago or something. Um, you know what that was? That was back when you guys used to tell evil stories, like evil Riley stories. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That I might think, have been an I evil. You said, I'm, "You said I don't want to go down that road and tell evil Jeff stories." But I'll tell you this one. <laughs> I think Riley used to tell a story about him buying that Han Solo figure before that one guy bought it who really wanted it, just so he could spite him. Right. And him uh, buy. I forget, there's some other stories with him, like Carl. Oh yeah, evil Riley has some good stories. Right. I think that was the only evil Jeff story I, you told. I missed really that. I missed that segment of Omni Bros. <laughs> well, we can bring it back. I don't know. Omar and Gabe's might be rated like R or something. So I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> Here's Sam, I need to hear the rest of the top five. I don't know if you're going to want to share those. That should be a campfire thing, Omni Bros. That, right. That's an Omni Bros campfire thing, the top tier of our Patreon. You can hear Jess's top five most embarrassing moments. And Lloyd Wong has a question for you, Jess, that I can't answer. Uh, it's not Carmel County. It was Carmel's in Monterey County. Um, I think Clint was mayor in 86. I was still living there. Uh, but I think this happened in 84. So it was a couple of years before Clint was mayor. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I've heard Pax Americana is like the best story in multiversity, the one drawn by Frank Quitely. Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of good things about multiversity. I should get that. I need to uh, now. I'm talking about it. I want to read it again. We should do a batter days about that at some point. Okay, Maybe good. I'll, I'll good. get that sometime soon. So you were talking about that multiplicity being your favorite story. I, yeah, now that I look at it again, it was really fun and interesting, and I really liked how they got. Oh, <laughs> but it's not my favorite character. Okay. My favorite character got introduced in Superman number four, where, let's see if I can find him. Um, my favorite character was introduced in a, in a part that, a section that I did not think was going to work out at all, and that is the Bizarro. Oh, that was a great story. I love that story. Bizarro. I, I loved um, Rob Zaro. Here he is. Oh, Rob Zaro. Here's a uh, boy Zaro. There's boy Zaro, but Rob Zaro with Robin with a with Alfred mustache. With the, yeah, with the fancy <laughs> mustache and being a ladies' man and starting to hit on like all the chicks he sees. See if I can, oh, here it is. For Damien <laughs> with the mustache. It's hilarious. It was, was a great story. I totally want to see. Um, I totally want to see. More Adventures of Rob Zaro. And I'm not Bizarro usually a big, great. And I'm not usually a big Bizarro fan, but I really enjoyed that storyline. Yeah, me same here. Well, basically, Boy Zaro, Bizarro Superman's son comes to our earth and they're like get to learn how to communicate with him and stuff like that and something bad is happening in Bizarro's world. And now we Rob world. Zaro at the fair with nobody <laughs> and Boy Zaro. And look at him, he's got a flower in his mouth and he's the fancy mustache, and that's Damien. That was so funny. And can you remember where nobody is introduced, that girl? I think she came in, because I remember after Batman and Robin, Patrick Gleason wrote and drew a Robin standalone title. And I think that's where she comes from. Oh. Do you know like, his big like red bat creature he has? 
Goliath. Yeah, Goliath. I think he was in, introducing that as well. Maybe I, the chat. I never I read that. That was book. interesting. So I'd like to see. I'd like to read more of that. Because I mean, the nobody character, her dad, I think it probably is, shows up in the first Batman and Robin arc. Nobody. He has all the red eyes. He has the black suit. She yeah. has to be related to him somehow. I just don't know where she came from. She uh, must show up in that Robin series. Um, does anybody in the chat know where nobody and Goliath came from? I'm if, I mean, someone might be able to correct me, but I'm pretty sure it's that Robin standalone series. It's it's Robin by Patrick Gleason. I yeah, mean, he actually uh, wrote and direct. He actually directed it. He wrote and drew it. Patrick because, Gleason did. Yeah, because if you notice, Patrick Gleason gets story credit on these books too. Right. Co-written basically, and so I think he wrote that Robin standalone series by himself. I never read it though. But oh, I'm gonna read that because I thought nobody and Goliath were interesting characters. I think you have it somewhere. No, I know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jeff has a yeah. Jeff was able to pinpoint where every single book that he owns is. <laughs> yeah, so Eric Odd says it's Robin, son of Batman. Robin, son of Batman. Has it been collected? I, it has. I just never got it. Oh, it has. Yeah, it has been collected. I know it exists. I know it's a. I think it's a hardcover or a trade paperback, but. I never read it. Marcelo Ramos has it. Glad I think it, on the cover at least I own them, but I haven't read it. I think it's two volumes on that of that series, if I remember correctly. Oh, let's see if Siri knows. <laughs> but I really hope they bring back Rob Zaro and Boy Zaro in the Bendis runs. Oh, I well, I don't think they do. Oh, I, really? I don't know. I, Bendis does have a good sense of humor, but whoever writes Rob Zaro next. Has to have a great sense of humor because that is the funniest character. There are two volumes of Robin Son of Batman. Uh, okay, two standard size hardcovers. Let's right, just hope, you, Eric. let's just hope they aren't with Jess's Stumptown hardcovers and the and the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> I'd never heard of this book, so I don't know. I've heard I've heard you say that before, Jess. <laughs> Whenever I asked you about the dregs, and then <laughs> I. For those of you who don't know, obviously some of you know that Jess and I do a Crime Corner show where we review crime comics. And I found this one uh, really interesting book called The Dregs. And I was like, we should review this. And I looked it up on YouTube to see if anyone reviewed it. And Jess had it in a hall. <laughs> and Jess, said he, Jess told me he didn't have it. I'm like, you do have it. You have it in this video. So I don't believe you. You probably have it. <laughs> and and I went upstairs and found it. I'm like, what the – what book? How did I have this? They're probably. I'm sure you have Robin somewhere. I no, I, no, I don't. <laughs> Lord Wong brings up a good point. He's. I feel like Superman and Super Sons are titles that complement each other. That's definitely a good point. If you like these runs, definitely read Super Sons. Oh, Super Sons is such a good book. And even in the fourth volume, there's that. There's two random issues ripped out of context with them fighting a future version of Tim Drake. Oh, that, that pissed me off. Well, here's the thing. It's a good story, but it's all in its completion in the Super Sons Omni. So I just totally skipped it in this book. The Super Sons Omni that's been reissued? No, oh, the, the old one. It was in there. It was? It was in there, yeah. You lied. Let me look. I'm pretty sure. I remember reading that. Because uh, I didn't have any memory of it. Well, Jess, that's not, my, that's not enough to go on. <laughs> If you had a memory of all the things you forgot, then we wouldn't be in some of the messes we're in. That's a good point. But yeah, Lloyd Wan brings up a really good point while Jess is trying to prove me wrong. I think you really should read Super Sons alongside this book. Because that looked like an interesting story, but I hate the way they presented it. That's the one thing about these DC Deluxes that are annoying. They just pull in a bunch of random issues and out of context because they don't show you the ones that complement them. Here's the Dino Mutt one. I remember that was good. Well, Jess, just read me what's on the on the back of the book. Read me what issues are in there. I can tell you if that issue's in there. Teen Titans case. 15? Yeah, that was in here. Action Comics. When was it Superman something? Superman 37 or something? Wait, okay. Collecting Super Sons 1 through 16, Super Sons Annual 1, Super Sons Dino Mutt, which was great, Superman 10 and 11, and 37 and 38. And Teen Titans 15. Yeah, because remember the issues where Damien and Robin meet together? That's also in the Super Sons Omnibus. So there are there are some overlap with these books. So it's in here somewhere, in the Super Sons. It is in there, yeah. I remember that storyline. It's a good storyline, but it's, it's not played off very well in this book. It's so ripped out of context, and you don't see how it ends. 
which really annoys me. Oh, wait a minute. I must kill Superboy. Oh, there's Tim Drake, and there he is in the bubble. You leave me no other option. Blah, 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 blah. Hello, Bruce. Why don't I remember the Super Sons of Tomorrow, part one, Dark of the Sun? Well, I'll be damned. So we've learned the lesson yet again to trust my memory over Jess's. Yeah, I shouldn't have challenged you publicly. Uh, not only did you challenge me, you called me a liar. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't forgive Lloyd Wong. Happens. Okay, I, I forgive you. Uh, <laughs> Lloyd Wong, I think you're definitely right. I think everyone needs to read Super Sons. I love that Omni. That's a great book. I'm also kind of annoyed that they are re reissuing it. I don't want, I'm not going to, I'm not going to upgrade. I'm just going to get those. Super Sons trades of the new series. Is it trades or hardcovers, Jess? Do you remember? They're trades, yeah. I haven't read them yet. They're right here, though. Are you going to upgrade for the new Omni? No. The trades are, like, right here. Have you ever seen them really do that before very much? They no. Upgrade? That's really strange. Yeah. I'm just going to get those trades. I love I love those two characters. Well, I want to read the story again now because this makes a lot more sense. Sam Cluxon asks us, um, have we reviewed Batman Gotham Noir and Batman Nine Lives? We have not. I think Gotham Noir is the book by Brubaker and Phillips, if I remember correctly. It's like a small, like 40, 50 issue, 50, sorry, 40 or 50 page story. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to get, I think. I'm pretty sure it's way out of print. It is, but it's. I don't think it's that expensive. I would like to have it. Is it pretty much like a, it's really short from what I remember of seeing on Amazon. It's like 40 or 50 pages or something. It's yeah. Yeah. I have it somewhere. I remember I discovered it, and it's not here with my um, Batman stuff. Be uh, I can't remember where I put it. I put it in some odd place, like the Bermuda Triangle, and now I can't um, find it. But it's supposed to be really good. And then Batman Nine Lies. I've never read that either. Uh, I have that, and you don't want it. Oh, why is that? Because it reads like a uh, private eye. Oh, everything's landscape. Oh, come on. All right. <laughs> that was, that's so annoying to me. I know. I don't know why people do that. Right. Yeah. Tim, uh, Tim Burnham is the one that talked me into getting it because he said it was oh, such really? a story, but it was, it was, he warned me that it was landscape. See, that's just going to totally make me not want to get it. So thank you for warning me. Yeah, I thought so. Ms. Comerol. I'm getting the new Super Sons Omni, never read it. You definitely should get it. If you don't have the other Omnibus, definitely get it. It's a fantastic story, and I greatly enjoy it. And it has the whole Teen Titans saga in it, too, which I don't remember. And it'll, it'll definitely enrich your reading of this story, I think, as well. Seeing more of Jonathan and what makes him tick and him working with Damien. I love that dynamic. Oh, yeah. together. It's fantastic. I love yeah. how Damien's older, but he's shorter, so Jonathan always makes fun of him for it. <laughs> I, it's so funny. Yeah. Uh, I think of anything else we didn't talk about in this. I think we both enjoyed the conclusion of Superman, how it wrapped up. Yeah. With that moving on the well. Yeah, I thought it wrapped up well. Oh, before uh, so we kind of we keep going back and forth, but it's hard to remember everything in order. What did you think about what the secret behind Hamilton County was and the people who lived there? Um, like, do you remember what happened with that? Yeah, I. I thought it was fine. I thought it was, um, I didn't think it was highly original. I thought it was interesting and, and I thought it was interesting and fine, but I didn't think it was that original and it didn't surprise me really, but I liked that he got a good friend out of it too. So yeah, I was just curious what you thought about that story. I thought it was okay. I didn't I, think it was fantastic or anything. I'll tell you what story I like. Number four in book four, um, there's a stir well, there's all the bizarro stuff. Um, I thought it was really interesting that he and his son go to um, a planet to save the planet. And oh, yeah. The majority of people on the planet know their planet is doomed, feel it's the will of their creator, and accept it and don't want Superman's help. And they say, we're okay with it. We understand it. We're ready to, to um, die because of our faith in our creator. And they find one scientist who um, helps them escape because, like, this incredible burst of faith overwhelms this, their superpowers on this planet. Um, 
and they get overwhelmed strength wise. I thought this was an interesting concept story um, that these sort of sea animals um, were um, the way they were portrayed um, that, a, that a gang of them could overpower Superman and uh, Jonathan and that this one scientist could sort of save them and just wanted to save his species. Um, it was too late to save the planet. He just wanted to save the species. But I thought that was an interesting concept. It didn't dwell. Um, it didn't dwell on the difference between faith and science too much. It it talked about how faith and science can work together. And I thought that it. I thought it was well done without beating you over the head with a concept of faith or a concept of science. It said they can both work together. So I thought that was interesting. And that was a story that wasn't by Tomasi. That was by James Robinson. Mm, okay. The one, the one note that didn't ring true to me was the end when the plant did blow up and Superman's like, let's go get some ice cream. <laughs> like, like we talk, you just saw like billions of people die. You're going to go get some ice cream. That part well, then, yeah, and then they talk about how beautiful it is. Right. That part was kind of weird to me. I liked everything besides the ending of that story where it was like, you just saw billions of people die. And you're just like, let's go get some ice cream, son. But that yeah. part was kind of weird. Um, you've read this story before in Action Comics 1000. What did you think of Tomasi and Gleason's little excerpt of Superman 1000? Oh, I thought it was fun. I, yeah, that was a really interesting story. Yeah. I like how it kind of went through the whole history of Superman. Right. That was yeah. really cool. I thought that I, was fun. I did really enjoy the ending. I thought it wrapped up everything really nice. And I really hope that Boy Zaro and Rob Zaro show up again, but probably not. Oh, I really want Rob Zaro to show up. Here's a good question from the fabulous Bobby Keating. I'm a newbie to Superman and I'm debating between the new 52 and rebirth eras to get started. Where do each you recommend I begin? At the beginning of this video is where you should start. <laughs> yeah, we do. Out there. <laughs> yeah, we talked about Jess's dislike of new 52 Superman because I never read it. I haven't heard a lot of good things about it. But if you are new to Superman, we did talk about some of our favorite Superman books to read before Rebirth because Rebirth isn't exactly new reader friendly. You do have to start with Final Days of Superman because that explains how the new 52 Superman goes away and how we get the original Superman back. And then read Lois and Clark by Dan Jurgens and Lee Weeks. And that explains the new dynamic with Superman and his family. So if you are going to get Rebirth, definitely get those two books and read them first. Yeah, watch this video from the beginning and we'll go through we go through these two books and tell you how you have to have them and then you can start in on rebirth which is what i think i would do instead of trying to figure out what's going on in new 52 i would just start with rebirth i think i agree i can't think of any other rebirth books that are as hard to jump into as superman everything else is pretty easy otherwise i think can you think of any other books that are that challenging to get into Everything else is pretty simple. New 52 or Rebirth? Oh, Rebirth. I'm sorry. Okay. Just because there was so much lead up to figuring out who this new, who this status quo Superman is, kind of going back to the way it used to be. To There's so yeah. much like, on-ramping to get there. Yeah. Harley Quinn was pretty much just a continuation of New 52. Batman Detective was easy. The Flash was easy. Yeah. Wonder Woman was pretty much like a retelling of the origin to a certain extent by Greg Rucka. I, I think this is the only really one that you really need to understand more about Superman's past and do some preliminary reading of the book, two books we already talked about. Yeah, I agree. So what did you think of the ending of Action Comics? We both didn't like love the first volume. What did you think of how it wrapped up? Okay, wait. Let me see here. Action number three. Where Booster Gold shows up. Oh, yeah, Booster Gold. I actually don't like Booster Gold, but I really did. I actually kind of liked how he played into this story. I thought it was interesting. Yeah. I thought the way Tom King wrote him in that storyline and his run with Batman wasn't that great. I thought it was okay. Right. I thought he was a little bit too – I know he's a jokey character, but I thought he was a little bit more um, – he had a little more nuance to his character in this run. You find out yeah. a little bit more about what, what makes him tick, why he does um, cover up his insecurities with humor, and you really find out why he does what he does, which I was really interested in. Yeah. I know was, and again, I didn't know that Dan Jurgens was a penciler. He did a lot some of these pages. Mm -hmm. So that I mean, it wasn't like any art to write home about, but it was, it was satisfactory. Yeah, certainly, I thought he did fine. 
Um, so I enjoyed that story where you show up on that planet that's been remade by Zod and his family and his son, yeah. Zod. I thought that was an interesting take that I'd never really seen before. And then uh, Lois trying to save her father, General Lane, who she did not talked to in years because she wrote an expose about a mission that he went on and he got really mad at her and how she introduces him to Jonathan and how they try to come back to a somewhat reasonable relationship where they're in each other's lives. I thought how that wrapped up was really interesting as well. Yeah, I thought so too. And I liked how Superman kind of decides how he wants to deal with Cyborg Superman going forward and how he wants to make sure he doesn't abuse him in the way that he imprisons him. I thought that was a really oh, yeah. very Clark thing to do. Batman yeah. just like, oh, go rot in the Phantom Zone. I don't care about you. But Superman's like, I don't want to be a, a cruel tyrant like Zod. If I'm going to imprison someone, I'm going to at least make their life decent, which I thought was beautiful for Clark to do that. Right. So I like the way this book wrapped. I think they both wrapped up on an emotional note. Right. I think I, I, kind, of, I kind of teared up at both of them because I really did care about the characters, and it was cool to see how they both were tied up in a neat bow and how you really see the characters were sent off in a good way. Mm -hmm. I think overall I did like Superman by Tomasi better, but I think J Jurgen's run was still solid, even though it wasn't as good. I agree with that too. That was pretty easy. We both agreed on everything. Yeah. There we go. I enjoyed both books. I highly recommend everybody read Superman in action, and I really recommend everybody read Super Sons, and I can also recommend Superwoman. There's three volumes, and you need to read Final Days of Superman to understand Superwoman because that's how they, Lana Lang and Lois Lane get their powers in Superwoman is from the Final Days of Superman. And Marcelo says, Dan Jurgens is a very good penciler. He drew some of the better pages in The Death of Superman, which I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, Sam Cluxon has another random question for you, Jeff, that I can't <laughs> answer. Tell me who that is. Uh, oh, you don't know Suzanne Flechette? I don't think so. Oh, uh, she's a very pretty actress. She was uh, in the first Bob Newhart show. Uh, okay. Do you know who Bob Newhart is? Yeah, I remember, I remember how he wrapped up his show with it being a dream. And she was, yeah, with oh, she, she was in the bed with him. Okay, he was, was the, Sam Plachette. He was uh, his elf dad and elf. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I always found Suzanne Plachette attractive, but I didn't have a crush on her or anything. Your viewers are very interested in who your seventies and eighties crushes were. Yeah, and uh, that's fine with me. I'm happy to tell them. <laughs> I'll tell you right away that my biggest crush was Barbara Eden. I loved Barbara Eden. I also don't know who that is. She was Jeannie and I Dream of Jeannie. Oh, okay. I have seen that. What did you like better, Bewitched or I Dream of Jeannie? Oh, that's tough. Uh, probably Bewitched. I don't know why, but I think I just like, as a kid, I liked Bewitched more, but I still watched them both. What did you think of the Will Ferrell remake? Never saw it. I, I heard, heard it was terrible, so I didn't see it. Yeah. Uh, Rorschach V, I have, well, oh, we're called the Dynamic Duo. That's pretty great. Right on. Thank you, Rorschach. I have not watched the latest Superman animated movie, and I don't think Jess has watched any of the animated movies recently based on his backlog. <laughs> no. <laughs> Jess still has 1,000 million movies to watch before he gets <laughs> to this movie. That's a rough estimate. <laughs> and it's close to being exactly right. And I've tried to be Jess's accountability partner on Batman the Animated Series, but it hasn't gone too well. No, uh, it's okay now. I mean, I'm I'm ready to watch. Um, there's a solid it. chance now that I'm done with this uh, readathon that I can watch some BTAS before I start my reading for Omnicat. Oh, that's weird that Joe Goose didn't get a notification. I got both. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe. We've been trying to put the streams out earlier so that we get two notifications, one 30 minutes before to give you a warning and one at the start of the show. So I'm sorry you didn't get those. Yeah, YouTube is the bane of my existence. But I did tell Jess we're never going to do a readathon this long again. <laughs> <laughs> we had over 100 issues of Superman. We, I enjoyed it, so it was fine, but it was, it was definitely a lot of work to get it completed. Yeah. I, I definitely left too much to this week. Um, you know, having a full-time job and having a son around it, I don't have as much free time as I used to. So it did oh. take a lot of my free time. 
Here's Bob, Bobby's totally right. I still have to watch <laughs> Old Guard. Jess, you got to do that this week. I really do. My I, wife really enjoyed it. Maybe Patty would watch it with you. Uh, it's what action? Is it act? It's action, right? There's a lot of action, but there's a good story behind it. It's Charlize Theron, so maybe just tell her that it's a female-centric movie. And I do want to see it badly. Tell her it was made by the creators of Anne with an E. <laughs> then she'll be totally into it. Um, we just watched some Anne with an E last night. Well, Lloyd Wong, I started this like three weeks ago, but Jess busted it all out this past week. So he Yeah, I have more time than you guys do. I've already lived my life. <laughs> You're having some of my favorite one-liners this week. <laughs> I mean, th this show. You had another good one earlier that made me laugh. <laughs> I've already lived my life. Yeah. You, should get, you should get a t-shirt made of that. <laughs> Okay, good. Joe Goose just bought the run, and he's need, he needs to read it. Oh, good, great. And hopefully you can read. Hopefully you've read Super Sons or have the Omni as well, because that'd be really a great way to read it. Reading Super Sons alongside of it. Oh, Maddie really likes Anne with an E. Good. Those are my favorite types of shows. <laughs> didn't you say that it was depressing you though? Like, then like a storyline happened that like made you upset. There, oh yeah, there was there was one. Maybe in season one, where I said, where I had Patty watch the next episode, and I said, it has to get better than that episode, or I'm done watching. It ended very, I thought it was very depressing and very sad. And she said um, that it got better and everything was fine. So I went back and, and watched it. There, I mean, there's just tons of real life in it. It's, it's uh, life in, in Canada in the 1900s. They've never been exposed to black people. They they have a tenuous relationship with um, uh, Native Americans. I mean, they're it's they're extremely white, and so it always, whenever ha they have these sort of real life inter and, and then there's a bully in the show that's a super bully. Like he is he. I want somebody to literally take a tire iron. <laughs> Shut up. Oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm sorry. I've been reading so much this week. I'm really tired. Thank you, Joe Goose, for noticing my shirt. I was trying. To, I was like, yeah, thank you, Lloyd. I was trying to sleep for like 30 seconds, but Jeff just didn't notice. He was enraptured in Anne with an E. Uh, it was good. Yeah. You know, Anne with an E reminds me of I just couldn't stand as a kid. My mom used to always watch it, Little House on the Prairie. Little House on the Prairie. I couldn't stand that show. Oh. That show was depressing. So many sad things happened in that show when the daughter went blind and the school children burned to death or something in the church or something. I just remember that show being like, wow, this is very dark. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I couldn't get into that show at all. The only time I ever watched it was when that guy I knew from UOP, Dean, I can't remember his last name. I, we were just fr barely friends, but he was a nice guy. He got a part on it after we graduated. And so I watched those episodes that he was in. Lloyd Wong wants to encourage you right now, Jess, with your what? you already lived your life comment. What's that? He says you have a lot of life to live, so you can finish all your unopened books. That has to be your reason for for living. Oh, you're right. Yeah, how many books are still in the cellophane, Jess? You can't you can't live you can't just give up right now. You have so many books to open still. <laughs> I always love when you open books on the air. It feels so special. <laughs> I opened and did an overview of the Spectre. That yeah, you did do that. So that I was, that was I yeah. I had to relax the spine so I couldn't show the uh, un unveiling of the cellophane on the air. <laughs> I had to do uh, Dean Butler. That's right, Lloyd Wong. Dean Butler. He was a nice guy. You I, all can like what you like. You can like Little House on the Prairie. You can like Anne with an E. Just don't tell me to watch it. We'll be fine. I'm never telling you to watch it. <laughs> we all can like what we like. That's fine. Absolutely. As long as you like Downton Abbey. Well, we're going to have a problem then. I think I'd rather watch Anne. I definitely would rather watch Anne with an E. Uh, they're pretty similar. I can't stand with all, all the malords that they throw, they throw each other's way. <laughs> and Marcelo has a compliment for Ooh, you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. I appreciate it. 
Yeah, Jess had some technical difficulties that were annoying, but he was able to figure them out pretty quick, though. I, yeah, I figured it out. I just put, I uploaded it and published it too soon, and so it was at low resolution, and I need to remember not to do that again. And Joe Goose is asking about help the new Hellblazer by Tom oh, yeah. Taylor. How did you do that? No, I was I was uh, all bottled up with my Superman run this week, so I didn't get a chance to get this yet. Um, I, you and Riley are both raving about it, so I do want to get it. I wonder if that has any variants you can get. I don't know that Black Label does that. Are you saying oh, that really? practically? No, I was just saying you're really into variants recently, so I thought maybe you'd want to get that. Yeah. Oh, that amazing Spider-Man, Bruce Tim. Oh, do you have that to show people, Jess? Um, that was really that was really cool. Oh, you ordered it. You didn't get it in. But I have, but I had the picture pulled off on the side here. Let's did see. you did you get your Joel Jones Catwoman statue yet? No, not yet. Oh no. Uh, let's see. I sent it to you. So let me see if I can pull it off. Here it is. Okay. Well, it's really good that we're getting a John Constantine book right now since the main title is being canceled. So I'm glad we're at least getting something from him. That pisses me off. Yeah, that's really. People okay. are signing a petition right now to try to get that series back. Oh, that'd be good. I've seen it floating around. Uh, here is the Mary Jane, Bruce Tim. comic variant that i'm getting i already ordered it i was telling jess that this is one of the only i think it's the only time i've seen bruce tim draw a marvel character um i've never i don't have the naughty and nice book like jess does so i don't know if he drew any did he draw any dc characters in that uh, yeah there was lots of dc characters then there was a naughty and nice version without the dc characters because uh there were licensing issues um but I don't remember any Marvel characters in it. Yeah, I've never seen him draw a Marvel character, so that's why whenever he sent me this, I was really surprised. I've never seen him do that. So that's really that's a really cool book, and you you're, you're getting one just for yourself and one for CGC and Signature, right? Yeah, that that's just because I'm a huge Bruce Tim fan. Well, I think you kind of look at you look at buying variants as a way to collect, but also as a way to flip in some ways too, right? Kind of I'm going to flip, but I'm not going to flip that. I want to frame that and put it up. Right, right. Um, <laughs> Sam has a, <laughs> is it possible for someone to be a fan yet still refer to it as downtown Abby? <laughs> <laughs> I met someone who did that and I didn't have the heart to correct him. I don't, uh, you know, that's a good question. Is the blonde in the background Jess's old girlfriend from the Carmel Bar? Yes, yeah, she was giving her <laughs> she was giving her boyfriend uh, the stink eye in the background there of that picture. You know what the funny thing is is that that woman's telling that telling that story from her perspective to other people. She's like, "Yeah, I this, just threw this jerk. I threw this drink in this jerk's face, and he was rolling around on the ground. And I just left him there." <laughs> I'm lucky she didn't kick me. It's just funny the stories that we tell are told from another perspective by somebody else. Yeah. Well, I, I was totally up to no good, and I totally deserved that drink in the face. Um, <clears throat> so I she, however she wants to tell it is probably the right way. <laughs> I was being a jerk. Well, you don't paint yourself in the most positive of light, so you probably told it the right way. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, Lloyd Wong, we have not read Joker Killer Smile by Jeff Lemire, but the hardcover is coming out, I think, next week. Oh, Maybe, really? Or two weeks from now, I think. I think it's not this upcoming Tuesday, but the one after. And I'm looking forward to it. I've heard a lot of good things about it, actually. I'm going to wait on that. I may hoopla that and then buy it because I mean, I'm sick of the Joker. Yeah, but it's Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino. I love yeah. that. Game. They did Gideon Falls and they did Green Arrow. I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like it has to be good, at least. I feel like it has to be decent. Yeah, that's Crazy true. Jane says she really enjoyed Killer Smile. I've heard a lot of good things about it. I think the whole bar did applaud. <laughs> she threw the drink. Maybe Sam Cluxon should tell the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she made a big deal out of the fact that she caught me. She, like, yelled at me. Yelled at me, spun me around, picked up the drink, and threw it in my face. What the F are you doing here? Well, we've all seen... We've all seen the picture of Jess on the beach with his shirt off. We can all tell that 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 Jess was a player. 
So. <laughs> With a mustache like that, how couldn't he be? Oh, man, come on. Well, Jess, you, you text me that – I think you posted this on your Instagram, that picture of you with your daughter back in 91 or 92, whatever it was. Oh, with her in the jumps? And you had the mustache, and my dad had a mustache. I'm like, if you were a dad in the 90s, you had to have a mustache. I feel like it was like a law or something. Well, you just had to have a mustache. I've pretty much had facial hair ever since I graduated college. So I, yeah, I, mean, I have it in my wedding picture. I've only shaved a couple times. Um, I've only been without a mustache a couple times in my adult life. Yeah, it was kind of disconcerting whenever you did the Wonder Woman thing and you were goateeless for a couple months. That was that was strange. That yeah, that felt weird. And Noir Wolf says Killer Smile is great, and Daniel N says Joker's Killer Smile is good. So it seems like a lot of people like it. No, oh, okay. So I, I'm definitely planning on getting it, and I want to review it on this show on Batter Days. So maybe I can get the hardcover, and you can read on Hoopla, and we can review it that way. And you can uh, buy it if you want to. Well, it is Jeff Lemire. You're right. It's Andrea Sorrentino. That art is fantastic. He's, yeah. They, they both are a great team. Yeah. They're Gideon Falls. I haven't read anything of Gideon Falls since the second volume, since I'm waiting for the inevitable hardcovers to be published, because he always gets one. So and I'm just going to wait. I really probably made a mistake following that in trade paperback i don't really buy image trades anymore unless it's like a really little known series because for the most part they end up getting hardcovers that's why i'm not getting old guard i've been reading that on hoopla because i know it's gonna get a hardcover lazarus already has a couple um black magic has one you know he's gonna make one eventually yeah you're right so holding i'll just read them on hoopla and then get them as a hardcover i i still want to upgrade it i mean i'll upgrade if i have to i just want to limit that if i can yeah i hate upgrading so you're right you know what I am going to upgrade on, though? That Mr. Miracle Deluxe. Ooh, that looks good. That looks really good. That looks fantastic. And that's one of my favorite books I read last year, so I'm definitely getting that. Yeah, I read that a couple times. I may have to upgrade on that. And I've said this multiple times. That's my favorite Tom King book. It's like Mr. Miracle and then Vision right below it. They're really close to me. Man. Oh, also, Lemire has his question Black Label book coming out. Oh, yeah. We should get that and review that as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to the question. Well, Bobby, uh, as Jess makes a sacrifice for all of us, he buys the trays so that the hardcovers will come out. Right. Uh, but, like, Jess and I both got all the Daredevil Chip Zdarsky uh, trades, and then the hardcover was announced like a couple of days later. That was I pretty annoying. I don't see how there's not a hardcover yet for Old Man Logan. I mean, there's like 11 volumes of that in trade paperback, and I've got them all. And that was popular too, wasn't it? Yeah. But most importantly, we are getting the all-new Wolverine Omnibus next year. That I'm happily upgrading to. And that is at a, an, an acceptable page number for Taylor Brown. It's around the 800-page <laughs> limit, so I'm going to get it. I have to have it around 800 pages or I'm not buying it. If it's even close to 1,000 pages – not getting it. Oh, that doorstop of Green Arrow's coming to my house. That thing's got to weigh three pounds alone. There's an, I, there was another fifteen hundred page book that was solicited recently. It's just there, I just don't I don't get how people read that. It's so it's like so huge. It's hard to even read. Yeah, I have a I have a laptop rest that I put on my lap, and that's where I I take the laptop off and put the book on it, and that's how I read books. So that's easy. So, so Lloyd's asking us how Sheriff of Babylon and Omega Men ranks in our Tom King. Do you want to rank your Tom King books and what you think of them? Can you? Is it? Uh, he, hasn't, he hasn't done that much, really. So I think it's pretty. It's pretty simple. I I liked Omega Men, but I liked everything else better than it. For me, it's probably it's Mister Miracle, it's Vision, Batman, Sheriff of Babylon, Omega Men. And then probably Superman Up in the Sky, which I still enjoy. It's at the bottom of the heap for me, though. And mm -hmm. I've never read Heroes in Crisis. I haven't heard anything good about it. So I'm assuming that's probably my least favorite if I read it. I think Editorial had stuck their face in there and messed it up. I did, I did enjoy Omega Men. I didn't like it enough to upgrade to the deluxe hardcover, though. Me I, either. I kept the trade. But for Mr. Miracle, I'm definitely upgrading. Uh, I would say I like his Batman more than I liked. I think Batman's top of the list for me. Then comes Vision. Then comes Mr. Miracle. Then comes Sheriff of Babylon. And then comes Omega Man. 
And I haven't read any of the strange tales, his, his Adam Strange story, so I can't speak to that at all. Yeah, me either. So I'm sure I'm going to like it. Him and Mitch Gerads are always good together. I'm, I'm not even going to try Heroes in Crisis. I haven't heard – Marcelo, you're the first person I've, I've I've heard from who actually liked Heroes in Crisis. So I'm kind of steering clear. Even though I heard the art's really good. Yeah, I gave that book away. Sam Clarkson for the third random question of the night. <laughs> <laughs> you're on a streak, man. <laughs> that is a deep pull, but if you really want to know <laughs> – I was in summer camp. It's July of '69, so I was 10 years old. And this was a this was a uh, my favorite summer camp. I went there 10 straight summers, kennel and camp in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, and of course, there was no televisions there. You were, you were just active all day and then went to bed. So there was there was no televisions or anything. You just weren't allowed to watch TV. And they had. The we got in the dining hall. They had the entire, all the kids. They had like three TVs set up, and the TVs were probably this big, like, like a laptop practically. <laughs> and they had them set up, and that's how we watched the moon landing. I think we were in our pajamas or something. <laughs> Maybe it happened at night on the West Coast. I can't remember, but we did watch it. Do you ever uh, watch those uh, Jimmy Fallon skits he does with Justin Timberlake with them at summer camp? No. And they like sing songs at night and the camp counselor runs in and yells at them. That's that, that's what that story reminded me of. You and your pajamas <laughs> at summer camp. I remember that same year, the Mets won the World Series and they let us in school watch TV and watch the final game because that was it was during the day. It was a day game. Uh, game five was. Um, in California, it was like a morning game. It's like ten in the morning. So Joe, I, that's when the World Series in '69 in school. And Joe Goose asked about his Grayson run. I'm I kind of go against the grain. I didn't love that book. I know Jess enjoyed it a lot more than I did. So actually, yeah. I, I forgot about that. That's at the bottom of my Tom King list. I did like that book a lot. It wasn't bad. I just think it was overhyped for me. It just didn't live up to the how, how hyped it was. I think a lot of people really just talked about it a lot and said it was like one of the best um, New 52 books. I just didn't enjoy it that much. But Crazy Jane, you're right. It's great to see Scott Snyder is going to be coming back to American Vampire. I love that series. Yeah. And I'm re I really want him just to finish it. And I hope that he does because I really enjoy that series a lot. Actually, I – I went through a really big fallow period of not reading comics for a long time. I used to read them in middle school and high school. Then you go to – I think a lot of people go to college and don't read comics <laughs> for a while. You kind of go through a dry period because you're you know, obviously going to college. You're not going to bring those with you unless Jess did. I don't think you did though. What? Did you bring comics with you to college? No. So I went through like four or five years not reading comics. Right. And then when I was married – actually, I got back into reading comics when I was married. And I, I heard about – Scott Snyder's Batman Court of Owls book. And I bought it and I just got straight on addicted to his run. And I read American Vampire and then it was into the black hole of comic collecting from there. So I, I have a really big soft spot for American Vampire. I remember I used to work at a call center when I was in grad school and I worked at night one time on Christmas Eve and no one was calling. So I just read American Vampire, like two trades <laughs> of that <laughs> and didn't take any calls on Christmas Eve. So I have a big soft spot in my heart for that book. Just also watched Game Six and Eighty Six. You've seen it all. <laughs> I have seen it all. I was just a speck in my dad's eye in nineteen eighty six. Uh huh. Yep. That's a really good point, Assassins. All Black Panther issues are free on Comicsology. No, well, they're not getting. I'm still not getting them. I mean, I the best Black Panther thing that I have ever experienced is the movie. I just I can't get into the comics for some Dang. reason. I don't know what I. But even in the movie, I mean, Chadwick Boseman is great in the movie. I just don't. I think the character is better as a side character. I like him better in the Avengers movies or the Avengers comics. Like even in the Black Panther movie, like Killmonger and his and his sister were more interesting characters to me. Actually, I agree with that. Even though Chadwick Boseman did great as Black Panther, I just thought on the page how he was written. I think he's not as interesting as other characters. That's right. just my personal opinion, though. Right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Lloyd Wong's asking about American Vampire. I didn't get the Omni. I have the trades. 
Um, with him finishing his run on American Vampire, does he have enough material for a second Omni? I'm pretty sure the first Omni is the first four trades. And so there's four other trades after that. So I'm pretty sure it would be enough. I think it's the first four or five trades. So we should be able to get a second omnibus at some point. Actually, my uh, computer is running out of juice. So we're going to have to wrap this up. All right. Just to kind of give uh, some trailers for future episodes. Um, the, uh, next Friday, Jess and I are going to be doing a crime corner about Cruel Summer by Ed Brubaker. Jess made the, <laughs> made the interesting choice of ordering on DCBS for 50% off, so it took him a while to get it. So we're going to be reviewing that and Punisher Soviet by Garth Ennis. And then two weeks from now, we'll have another Batter Days. It's actually going to be Batman Day, September 19th. And Jess and I are going to do a special episode about our favorite Batman moments from comics, from movies, from video games, TV shows, and our favorite memories. Just things about Batman that we look back on and remember, oh, that was a really cool memory that we had with the character of Batman and how it actually impacted my life. And the plan is... Tyler Blunt's going to also make an appearance to give his summer of DC report because he spent his summer reading a lot of DC books and we need T.L.R. Blunt to come on and tell us about them. We should have Riley on too to talk about Batman that day. Well, maybe you can text him after we're off here to ask him. Here's the ultimate compliment, Taylor. We oh, thanks, dude. Saturday. That's great. Thank you, Marcelo. You probably couldn't say anything nicer to us than that. That's like the ultimate compliment. Well, it's great because before I did any of these shows, I remember, you know, Jess's show, Omni Bros, Near Mint Condition, they used to really be a big um, impact to me and just really helping me. So it's great to be a part of that for other people. So thank you for saying that. Yeah, that's a big deal. Thanks. So everybody out there, thank you for watching. Thank you uh, to everybody watching this afterwards. Thank you to everybody in the chat. There were Great chatting today, and of course, Sam Cluxon, knowing my life better than I do. Thank you for uh, helping me remember things. Um, and uh, please give us a like. Please hit subscribe, and uh, feel free to leave a comment. We always respond to comments. And peace and love. Peace and love. See you guys.